Yeah, as Dave mentioned, I've had the uh, privilege of studying high-performing technology organizations uh, for since 1999. And so that was a journey that started back when I was the CTO and technical founder of a company called Tripwire in the information security and compliance space. And, and so we started studying these uh, these uh, amazing organization that had uh, the best project due date performance in development, they had the best operational stability and reliability in ops, and also the best posture of security and compliance. And so the goal was always to understand how did those amazing organizations make their good to great transformation so that we could understand how other organizations could replicate their amazing outcomes. Uh, and, and so, as you can imagine, in a 20-year journey, there were many surprises. But by far, the biggest surprise for me was how it took me into the middle of the DevOps movement, which I think is urgent and important. I think the last time that any industry has been disrupted to the extent that our industry is being disrupted today was likely manufacturing in the 1980s when it was revolutionized through the application of lean principles. And I think that's exactly what DevOps is. You take those same lean principles, apply it to the technology value stream in which we work in every day, and you end up with these amazing and emergent patterns that allow organizations to do tens, hundreds, or even hundreds of thousands of deployments per day while preserving world-class reliability, security, and stability. And so that's something I didn't even think possible 10 years ago. So uh, in 2013, uh, as uh, Dave mentioned, I, I was co-authored a book called The Phoenix Project, and I cannot tell you how uh, gratifying it's been to see that book being used by the DevOps community to find allies, find, find fellow collaborators and conspirators uh, to help uh, achieve the goals that DevOps aspires to. Uh, but I can't overstate how much I've learned since then. And so what I'd like to do this morning is share with you uh, some of my top learnings and share with you what I've been working on lately. So uh, before, the first thing I'd like to do is actually just uh, provide my personal definition of DevOps. This is what we put into the DevOps handbook in 2016. And specifically, it is the architecture, technical practices, and cultural norms that enable us to increase our ability to deliver application and services more quickly, um, which enables us to rapidly experiment and innovate. It allows us to deliver value to our customers in the fastest possible way, while preserving world-class reliability, security, and stability. So why do we care about that? It's because it is these uh, capabilities that allows us to win in the marketplace. So I, I love that definition um, because it actually doesn't say what DevOps is. Uh, instead, it describes the outcomes that we aspire to. Um, however, uh, there is a definition that I do like more, and it didn't come from me, it came from John Smart, uh, who for many years led the better ways of working at Barclays. So it was an organization founded in the year, the year 1634, which actually predates the invention of paper cash. And so John Smart's definition is this, it's simply better value, sooner, safer, and happier. I love it just because it is so short and succinct, uh, but also, uh, I believe, entirely accurate. So uh, let me just share with you uh, why I think this is so important. So uh, the Phoenix Project is really a story about a downward spiral uh, that, uh, in some ways, is best verbalized by uh, Ward Cunningham when he uh, coined the phrase technical debt. And I love that phrase because to me it evokes uh, this incredible image of like something like this. It is the accumulation of all the crap that we put into our data centers or all the shortcuts we put into our code, each time made with a promise that we're going to fix it when we have a little more time. But the way that human nature works and the way that life works in general is that there's never enough time. And so the notion of uh, technical debt you know, has a, uh, a, a hidden or maybe very obvious meaning, which is that it can get worse over time. So this is bad. Uh, but it's not as bad as what it can become, which might be like this, right? And so this happens every time that uh, you know, we don't write automated tests. It happens every time we manually do a deployment or manually configure an environment. Um, it happens when we don't integrate uh, technical debt reduction into our daily work. Uh, and so this is also what sets the stage for the intertribal warfare that can exist between dev and ops. So here's our friendly developer who uh, furiously works on features, checks into the source code repo at 5 p.m., uh, not realizing, and then they go to the bars buying drinks for each other, not realizing they've set the entire data on fire, data center on fire. And now you have uh, ops, uh, QA, maybe even information security, and intoxicated developers working all weekend, try to get things running before Monday morning, before customers notice. Um, and so the downward spiral hill looks like we have an ever-increasing number of sub one incidents. We have an ever amount of um, uh, less time to work on uh, technical debt reduction, uh, which means that we have to work even more furiously to get things to market. And this affects us whether we are, uh, and it affects all of us in the technology value stream, and it leads us to a feeling that we are trapped in a system that preordains failure, that we are powerless to change the outcomes. And it doesn't matter whether we are a, uh, in operations or a, we're a developer, or we're a product manager, or information security, or an enterprise architect. <laughs> and so 
there's still so many problems that remain. And these are the things I want to explore uh, in this book called The Unicorn Projects. And so specifically, these are the problems I've really come to care a lot about. One is the absence of understanding or even our ability to see uh, the invisible structures that are needed to truly enable developers to be productive. Um, two is there's this other problem uh, that is spookily orthogonal to the one that DevOps set out to solve. DevOps rightly saw that it took so much effort to get code to where it needed to go to, specifically in production, so that customers could get value. So this is other orthogonal problem of data. Data is often trapped in systems of records in uh, places where it's almost too expensive to get out. Um, it, it might be trapped in data warehouses, and it takes weeks, months, or even quarters to get data to where it needs to go, which is in the hands of developers so they can use it in their daily work. Um, there's often very strong opposition to support these new ways of working, uh, and there's often very amb uh, there's ambiguity in what behaviors we really need from the top levels of leadership to support these kinds of transformations. And so uh, in the Phoenix Project, we had the three ways. Uh, we had the four types of work. And so uh, in the Unicorn Project, I used a, uh, a model of the five ideals. Uh, and so it is uh, the first ideal is locality and simplicity. Uh, the second ideal is focus, flow, and joy. The third is improvement of daily work. The fourth is psychological safety. And the fifth is customer focus. And so uh, this morning, what I'll do is go through each one of them and give you, uh, paint a picture for what ideal looks like and what, uh, uh, what all too often uh, the not ideal, what that looks like. Uh, but before I do that, I do want to uh, take a moment to share with you why this is so important. Now we know from the research, uh, one of the things I'm most professionally proud of uh, is working with uh, Dr. Nicole Forsgren and Jez Humble on the State of DevOps Report. For six years, uh, we've conducted a cross-population study that now spans over 36,000 respondents. Uh, so we can understand what does high performance look like and what are the cultural norms, uh, technical practices, or architectural practices that enable performance. And so by the way, the cross-population study is the technique that uh, the medical community used to identify the link between smoking and early morbidity and early mortality. And so here's what we found in our uh, research. For six years in a row, it's always the same. High performers exist, and they massively outperform their non-high performing peers. Uh, one measure is deployment frequency. High performers, uh, this is out of the 2019 study, uh, are doing multiple deployments per day, two orders of magnitude more frequently than their peers. But more importantly, uh, when they do a deployment, they can uh, achieve them within one hour. In other words, how quickly can we go from a change being put into version control through integration, through testing, through deployment, so that customers are actually getting value. High performers can do that in one hour or less, whereas uh, their peers might take uh, weeks or months. So that's two orders of magnitude difference. Um, when high performers do a deployment, uh, they are seven times more likely to have those deployments succeed without causing a sub-one incident, uh, service impairment, a security breach, or compliance failure. Uh, and when bad things happen, uh, which Murphy's Law does guarantee, they can fix it in one hour or less, three orders of magnitude uh, faster than their peers. And so, uh, you know, for six years in a row, it's been, we see the same thing, these very decisive differences between high and low performers. And we also know that uh, the only way that you can get these kind of amazing reliability profiles is by doing smaller deployments uh, more frequently. So uh, over the years, we've looked at other uh, measures of quality. One is uh, security. We know that high performers, because they are integrating information and security objectives into everybody's daily work, uh, they're spending only one half the amount of time remediating security issues. And because they're doing a better job in controlling unplanned work, they can deploy nearly a third more time on planned work. So these are the more strategic activities versus the you know, barely value-preserving activities associated with firefighting. So a big breakthrough for us was uh, in uh, 2015, where we, uh, where we looked at organizational performance. What we found was that high performers, in addition to all these other virtues, were twice as likely to exceed profitability, market share, and productivity goals. And uh, the next the following, two years later, we looked at not-for-profits too. So what if we were a government agency or a military service or a not-for-profit? Um, we found that th the same multiple of performance. Uh, they were twice as likely to achieve organization and mission goals regardless of how they measured it, whether it was customer satisfaction, quality, or quantity. And so to me, the, uh, this, what it showed me was that it doesn't actually matter what the mission is. If it relies on technology, DevOps principles and patterns helps with the achievement of those outcomes. Here's another uh, marker of organizational performance. We found that in high performers, 
uh, employees were twice as likely to recommend to their friends, their organizations as a great place to work. And so this is called the Employee Net Promoter Score. So uh, this is a great uh, measure of engagement, uh, happiness, the amount of fulfillment that we feel in our daily work. And so to me, you know, if we go beyond the numbers, what this really starts uh, suggesting to me is what the opposite of technical debt is. And in my mind, it is this. It is to what extent can we safely, quickly, reliably, securely, and even happily uh, achieve all the goals, dreams, and aspirations of the organizations that we serve. Maybe put a, a sort of an informal benchmark to you. Uh, you know, in my mind, this is what it suggests that the mission of DevOps is really to create the conditions so that we can use every miracle that technology enables and get these kind of amazing outcomes. So uh, Instagram was acquired by Facebook for a billion dollars. That was 10 engineers. Uh, Pokemon Go, the f first property, the fastest property to a billion users, that was 25 engineers. So wouldn't it be amazing if we can take those same type of amazing accomplishments and do those in any modern uh, business setting? So in the Unicorn Project, uh, we're using these five ideals to really paint a contrast between good and bad. So the first ideal is locality and simplicity. Uh, for, I think the best way to motivate this is by uh, sharing the story of the birth and death of a technology called Sprouter at Etsy. So Etsy is where John Allspaugh from the 10 deploys a day um, famous presentation ended up in uh, 2011. They went public three years ago. Uh, and in my mind, this was one of the biggest aha moments uh, for me. So this is a story about how engineers work together in order to create value for customers. So in the bad old days of Etsy in 2008, uh, even they knew they had this problem. Uh, they wanted, uh, they saw that in order to ship a feature and have customers be able to use it, two teams would have to work together. Uh, you had the developers working in the front end inside of PHP, and then you had the, uh, the DBAs working in the back end inside of the stored procedures inside of Postgres. And so this meant that these two teams would have to communicate and coordinate and prioritize together, uh, potentially deconflict and schedule um, and coordinate and marshal um, all those changes so they can go into production uh, successfully. And so uh, this, this created a lot of overhead. And so their goal was to enable these teams to work independently. And that's why they wrote a technology called Sprouter. Sprouter calls is short for stored procedure router. And the idea was that the devs and DBAs could work independently and then meet in the middle inside of Sprouter. And as Ian Malpas said uh, from Etsy, this required a degree of synchronization and coordination that was rarely achieved to the point that almost every deployment became a mini outage. And if you're doing 20 or 30 deployments per day, right, uh, this is not a good thing. And so as part of the great um, uh, movement to create engineering greatness at Etsy, their, one of their goals was to kill Sprouter. So they started using this object relational model thing in the, in the front end so that the entire fit of functionality could be just done by the front end engineers. And what they found was astonishing is that every part of the property where they killed Sprouter, suddenly deployment lead times went way down and the quality of outcomes went way up. So what I find so amazing about this is that this is one of the most incredible demonstrations of Conway's law. And so if we go from two teams having to communicate and coordinate, prioritize Marshall to three teams, right, we saw that code deployment lead times went up and deployment outcomes went down. And as we go from three teams having to communicate, coordinate, synchronize, and marshal to no teams having to coordinate with each other, right, suddenly code deployment lead times go down and quality of the outcomes go up. And so for me, the big lesson is it's not enough to move uh, boxes around on an org chart. It's not enough just to create the teams. You must also have a software architecture uh, that is congruent to that, that allows teams to independently develop, test, and deploy value to customers without having to uh, coordinate and communicate all the time. And so what is so amazing to me is that it's so visible when you can go from three teams to one team. But in most large complex organizations, we're not talking about three teams, it might be 30 teams. So when you open up a ticket on the left and navigate through all the work required to get into production, get environments, make sure they're configured properly, get the uh, test data sets loaded, um, execute the regression testing, get the change approvals, do security review, middleware teams, right? You might be looking at 20, 30 teams. Right? And it doesn't take a lot to go wrong uh, before you're looking at code deployment lead times measured in weeks, months, or even quarters. Uh, does anyone here have a friend uh, that can relate to some elements of the story? Right. 
So you are not alone. Uh, and so that is a marker of architecture. And one of the biggest learnings for me out of the State of DevOps report uh, was in 2017, where we found that architecture was one of the top predictors of performance. Architecture is, has a higher uh, degree ability to predict performance than even continuous delivery. As measured by what? To what extent can uh, you make large scale changes uh, to your parts of the system without permission from anyone else? To what extent can you do your work without a lot of fine grained communication coordination with uh, people outside of your team? To what extent can you deploy and release your service on demand independent of other services that you may depend upon? To what extent can you do your testing on demand without the use of an integrated test environment, of which there are never enough, they're never cleaned up, which actually jeopardizes the testing objectives? And if all those things are true, chances are you can actually do deployments during normal business hours with negligible downtime. And so, to me, the reason why this is so shocking is that 20 years ago when I was at uh, Tripwire, the way that we were trained was that it was always safe to ignore architects, even especially chief architects, right? Because we all knew that they live in an ivory tower uh, and they only come out once a year and that is to publish out a Visio diagram and a PowerPoint slide, email it to everybody, and then go back to their ivory towers never to be seen again for another year. And so this is just a polite way of saying they didn't impact how daily work was performed. Uh, and so that's probably not true. Maybe I'm being a, a little bit mean-spirited. But if that were ever true, it's certainly not true now. What this shows is that nothing impacts more the daily work of engineers and developers than architecture. And so uh, what is a way to measure this? So in uh, the Phoenix Project, we probably had, there was a measure called the bus factor, right? So uh, how many people need to be hit by a bus in order for the project, service, or organization to be in grave jeopardy? And so in the Phoenix Project, uh, the bus factor was one, right? It was Brent. So uh, you couldn't fix an outage without Brent. Uh, you couldn't even do a major piece of complex work without Brent. And so you want this number to be far larger than one, right? You want it uh, to be maybe a team or uh, hopefully a lot of teams. Um, larger is better. So the metric I'd like to ascribe to the architecture factor uh, is lunch factor, right? For if you want to get something done, uh, how many people do you need to take out to lunch? Is it the Amazon ideal of the two pizza team? Or do you need to feed everybody in the building? So if you are doing a complex deployment that requires 100 or 200 people to deploy, right, you are feeding everybody in the building. So uh, you know, the more that we can shrink the lunch factor, uh, actually it describes you know, to what extent can teams independently develop, test, and deploy value uh, to customers. So an ideal of this in code is that uh, anyone can implement what they need to just by looking and uh, changing one file, one module, one application, uh, one container, uh, whatever, right? You make that change and you can uh, deploy value to customers, even around cross-cutting concerns, right? Through things like sidecars or uh, things using aspect-oriented programming. Not ideal is that to implement your change, uh, you need to understand and change all the files, all the modules, all the applications and containers, right? And uh, you know, that is obviously you know, going to have a very high lunch factor. Um, ideal is in or when we can make our changes, uh, we can independently ind implement them and test them so that we can get some assurance that when we put it into production is actually going to work as designed. And so, uh, so much of the notion of composability, right, uh, this, uh, this addresses. Not ideal is that whenever we want to implement and test our changes, uh, it has to be tested in the presence of every other component. And this is what almost always pushes us towards the need for an integrated test environment, uh, of which, you know, the problems I've already described. And, and so that means that everything is coupled together and you can't test them independently. So uh, there's another aspect, which is um, around uh, how decisions are made. In the ideal, every team has the expertise, capability, and authority to do what our customers uh, ask. Um, not ideal is that in order to do what our customer asks and needs, uh, we have to and make a decision. We have to go up two levels, over two, and down two. So a uh, visual depiction of this is that we need to make a decision, so we go up to, over to, and down to. And uh, so th my friend calls this the square, right? And he said that's actually the lucky path. The unlucky path is we actually have to do the return path so that two engineers can actually talk together and work together to be able to solve a problem together. Uh, by the way, how am I doing here so far? Is this interesting? Okay, all right. Um, good. So. Uh, I'll just say that for me, one of the most stunning demonstrations of uh, the first 
ideal and not ideal, is a book called Team of Teams by General Stanley McChrystal. So this is a story about the Joint Special Forces Task Force uh, that were, were in Iraq in 2004. Uh, and their problem was that they were tasked to protect the citizenry, um, but uh, they were trying to defeat a far smaller but far more nimble adversary, and the results were not so good. Um, they describe, uh, he describes very famously, uh, this problem was that, was this, the team was the boundary of which everyone else sucked. So the, the problem was that when you have these special forces across all these military branches, right, whether it was the US Navy SEALs, or the US Army Rangers, or Delta Force, right, they were all the best. And so everybody else sucked, right? Uh, and then you had the intelligence agencies that they had to work with. So how do you create a dynamic where they are working as a team of teams working together uh, to solve um, the objective, uh, to solve a problem, uh, to achieve a mission. And they did that by pushing decision making uh, down to the very edges. And it is one of the most uh, astonishing stories uh, that I've ever seen. And it uh, just, and the fact that it exists within uh, organizations that have centuries of a command and control tradition uh, makes it all the better. This is certainly one of the best books I've read in the last 10 years. So uh, another uh, part of the first ideal is uh, data. Uh, every team has access to the data they need on demand quickly, accurately, uh, and securely. Not ideal is that in order to get the data we need, uh, we have to wait months uh, or even quarters and hope that when they change the schemas, not every report breaks like last time. Uh, and I'm just, I think this is such an important problem because somewhere between 30 and 50% of all employees in most organizations are actually view data or manipulate data as part of their daily work. And more than ever, we as developers need this in order to make um, the right decisions to help us win in the marketplace. And there are so many great talks on this topic uh, here at Yao. So the first ideal was locality and simplicity. Now the second ideal is focus, flow, and joy. And so for me, the, this, so much of this was informed uh, by learning a functional programming language called Clojure. Uh, it is a Lisp programming language. Uh, it runs on the JVM and in the JavaScript. Uh, and this was by far one of the hardest things I've ever learned. Uh, it took me 60, uh, probably 60 hours to actually write my first running program. Uh, and yet it is what I would, uh, I, it brought back the joy of programming back into my life. And maybe just to frame uh, how much of a surprise this is for me. Um, for decades, I've primarily self-identified as an ops person. Uh, this is actually despite getting my graduate degree in compiler design and high-speed networking uh, in 1995. And I think I always gravitated towards ops because it was my observation that it was ops where the saves were made. It was ops that saved the customer from terrible developers who didn't do enough testing and blew up production, right? It was ops who made sure that the customer wasn't impacted. Um, it was also ops that really protected the organization uh, because security people were so mostly ineffective. And yet, uh, since learning closure, without a doubt, I self-identify as a developer. Um, and I've had this uh, experience that uh, there's this one program that I use at conferences where it uh, allows me to take notes and tweet at the same time, which is actually very helpful when you're writing a book. Uh, and so the first um, version that we wrote, it was in uh, Objective-C, uh, 3,000 lines of code. Uh, I rewrote it in uh, TypeScript and React in half the amount of code. Uh, and then rewrote it again in ClojureScript, and it was a third, again, as small. Uh, so it, not only was it smaller, but I found that for over three years, I've been able to keep adding functionality to it without having it collapse in on itself like a house of cards, which has been my primary experience coding uh, for the last 30 years. And so uh, it means that you can do so much with so little these days um, with so little effort. Um, so I think there are a lot of... One of my famous quotes, favorite quotes is from the French philosopher Claude Lévi-Strauss, and he would say of certain tools, is it a good tool to think with? And I think there's so many notions in functional programming like immutability, pure functions, the desire to have things compose that are better tools to think with. So it was popularized by Lisp and ML, popularized by a whole bunch of other programming languages of which are talked about exuberantly at uh, the Yao uh, Lambda Jam conference. Um, I believe that these uh, concepts are not just for programming languages, we are actually seeing them show up in infrastructure and operations. So uh, for example, Docker is fundamentally immutable, right? If you wanna make a lasting change in a container, you, know, you can't really change it in from inside the container, you have to make a new one. Uh, Kubernetes takes that from not just the system, but takes it to the system of systems level. 
Um, whenever you see Apache Kafka, uh, chances are there is someone that's using it to create an immutable data model, right? So that you are no longer allowed to erase the past, which makes uh, working with data so much safer. Um, and even Git and version control is fundamentally using an, an immutable data model, right? Is that that's why you get yelled at if you rewrite the commit history. And there's so many great talks on data here. Um, so all of these things is what for me has allowed the second ideal of focus and flow and joy. So in my ideal, uh, our time and energy is focused on solving the business problem that we want to solve and that we're having fun. Not ideal is that all your time is spent trying to solve problems that you don't even want to solve, like uh, writing YAML configuration files and trying to figure out how to make the, the parser happy or escaping spaces and file names inside of make files or writing bash scripts. Uh, and so uh, one of the oddest and most surprising things that Clojure did to me was that there was a whole category of work that I used to enjoy uh, in previous decades, but now I detest, uh, like these, like everything outside of my application. I've now become one of those developers who care about nothing outside of their application. I hate connecting anything to anything else. Like, because it always takes me a week, uh, especially databases. I don't like updating dependencies. Uh, I don't like secrets management. I am the person who checks in the secrets into the repo. That causes all sorts of problems. Uh, bash scripts, YAML, patching, um, uh, writing Kubernetes deployment files. I'm the person who can't figure out why my cloud costs are so high. And by no means am I diminishing uh, this, these things, right? In fact, these are probably some of those important things that we need to do uh, when we build software, but I just don't want to do them anymore. Um, whatever joy I used to get out of it, I just don't get anymore because uh, I uh, love solving the problems that I want to solve. And so I think this is why uh, developer platforms are so uh, important. Uh, the notion that uh, if we we're in infrastructure operations or security, our goal is not to do the work for other people. Our goal is to put the expertise into the platforms that we build that developers can then use. And now we inherit the best known understandings of how we solve problems safely, securely, and reliably uh, without having to talk to anyone else. And these are the conditions that allow us to have immediacy and fast feedback which allow us to have focus and flow, and I would assert even joy. And it's amazing to me that so many of the things that uh, we need to do to run service in production, like monitoring, deployment, environment creation, security scans, orchestration, all those things are increasingly being able to be done uh, through self-service platforms. And that is why I believe that uh, you know, the best days of infrastructure operations are certainly not behind us, uh, they are ahead of us, because the goal is to enable developers uh, to be productive and not have to, um, they, so that they can spend their best energies on solving uh, the business problems. So I made this uh, observation about, uh, this comment about flow. So flow uh, was coined by Dr. Mihaly Csikszent Mihalyi. And so he gave one of the best TED Talks ever, uh, Flow, The Secret to Happiness. He wrote this amazing book called Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience. And so he calls the state of flow is that when you're having so much fun and satisfaction working on a problem, you lose track of time. You might even lose sense of self, right? Is that transcendental experience when you're doing what you truly love? And, and so, uh, there's two types of learning uh, he alludes to. One is procedural learning, or maybe it's called declarative learning. That's the notion of you're doing learning that you value, right? Often that you are building uh, this learning on top of decades of other learnings, and you value it because that you are going to be using these learnings uh, for decades to come. So that's one type of learning. The other type of learning is called one-shot learning. So these are the problems that you need, you, you're solving, not because you want to, but because you have to, right? So these are like, how do I escape file names inside of uh, 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 make files? Uh, how, how do I escape spaces inside of make files? How do I do my YAML files? Um, uh, I started getting the habit of make, taking screenshots of my Google search history whenever I am doing something uh, that's one-shot learning. In this case, it's uh, trying to figure out Java date time um, objects, right? I know it's important. Time is very important, right? But it's just not something that uh, I woke up that morning and set out to solve. Uh, so, so the more that we can stick to get away from one-shot learning and use our platforms to do it, I think the more that we can have focus, flow, and joy. There's one other thing that I want to share with you around this, just because it, for me it was another one of the top aha moments in the state of DevOps research, which is the importance of code deployment lead time. So code deployment lead time sounds like a very tactical measure, 
right? It sounds like this is a metric that is only the responsibility of the CICD team. And yet, I will try to convince you that this is actually the most strategic measure of any technology organization. Uh, and specifically, code deployment lead time, again, is how quickly can we go from code committed uh, into the source code repo, through integration, through testing, through deployment, so that customers are actually getting value. And so you might ask the question, why do we start the lead time clock there? Right? Why don't we start it earlier when a feature goes into development or is accepted uh, by the developers? Or why not at the point of which uh, the idea was first conceived, at the point of ideation? And so those are absolutely valid lead time measures. But what is special about the code deployment uh, point in time is that it is a dividing line between two very different parts of the value stream. So everything to the left of things being put into version control is design and development. So the nature of design and development work is that it's highly variable. Often it's work that we're never doing, we've never done uh, before, so we're doing it for the first time. And chances are we may never do it again, right? And so it doesn't take minutes or hours. It might take weeks, months, or quarters. And that is fundamentally uh, a part of design and development work. But everything to the right of changes being put into version control is product delivery, build, test, and deploy. And so there, we want the exact opposite characteristics. We want builds, tests, and deploys to happen quickly, reliably, repeatedly. And in fact, we actually want them to be happening all the time. Uh, we want very low, we want not only to be quick, right, but we want to have very little variance uh, from one to the other. Uh, and so what is amazing about this lead time here is that it sim simultaneously predicts the effectiveness of build, test, and deploy, but it also predicts how quickly are we giving developers feedback on their work. So if I'm a developer and I make a mistake and I check into version control, if the first opportunity for me to detect that I made that error is nine months later during integration testing, the link between cause and effect has basically vanished, right? So when things blow up in integration testing, right, was it my problem? Of course not. It was one of the other 99 jackasses who is one of their changes, right? And so the, the time to find and time to fix is very, very long. Worse, I could actually have made the same mistake for you know, nine months, right? Uh, so you know, increasing the surface area of problems that need to be solved. In the ideal, what do we want? We want uh, what the point at which I commit it into version control. We want automated testing to kick in. And ideally, I should be notified you know, within minutes, worst case, hours. And so that way, time to find the issue is much faster, and also uh, the time to fix is much faster. And that, you know, in practice, it's probably two or three orders of magnitude better. And I will also prevent the case that I'll be making the same errors for nine months in a row. So we learn not just from our mistakes, but ideally we want to learn from our customers as well, right? And we learn through customers through techniques like experimentation, uh, A-B experiments, uh, journey mapping. And, and so the, how many experiments we can perform is actually gated by how quickly we can execute uh, this feedback loop. And so code deployment lead time looks very tactical. Uh, but in my mind, I will try to convince you that this is actually one of the most strategic measures of any technology organization. And so um, there's actually one question that you can ask uh, that predicts with startling accuracy, not just code deployment lead time, but mean time to prepare, and the presence of a great architecture, and the presence of great technical practices, and culture. And it's actually, you can predict all of these things, or should it correlate uh, with these things by just asking one question. On a scale of one to seven, to what degree do we fear doing deployments? One is we have no fear at all, we just did one. Seven is we have existential fear of doing deployments, which is why if we could wave a magic wand, the next deployment we'll do is never, right? So, and it just shows how good the brain is at uh, ascribing fear to problematic activities, just like uh, you know, thinking fast and thinking slow. So the ideal is when we can uh, implement and test our features that are working on our laptop and learn whether it works in seconds and be able to quickly deploy uh, without problems. Not ideal is that the only way we can determine whether our feature works or not is by waiting minutes, hours, days, or even weeks. And the way we learn about it is by customers complaining. So another ideal is uh, that we are doing things like trunk-based development where we don't have long-lived feature branches. Those are quickly merged into master and whatever is into master uh, gets rolled out to production you know, or some sort of production-like environment uh, multiple times a day. Not ideal is that every time that we merge our code together, it takes five days and 50 people in conference rooms uh, and printing out things, trying to figure out you know, how to stitch our code back together. 
Um, this screenshot is here uh, just to remind myself of how bad I am uh, at merging. Uh, so on many projects, I'm the only person working on it, and often I'll have multiple feature branches, and I will find that often, if I don't merge right away, I can't even merge my changes uh, together, right? Often it's easier for me to just to retype the changes in, right, than to do an automated merge. And so what that suggests to me is that the idea of 100 developers merging their changes together once every three months, uh, the ability to do that successfully, I think, is at best an illusion, right? You need some sort of practice to integrate uh, frequently. So the first ideal is locality and simplicity. The second ideal is focus, flow, and joy. And the third ideal is improvement of daily work. And so this showed up in the Phoenix project. Um, and it returns in the Unicorn project. And the notion of this is that improvement of daily work is actually more important than even daily work itself. So ideal, not ideal, is twaddy. Uh, the way we've always done it. Uh, ideal is MTBTT, or uh, as Google SREs would say, make tomorrow better than today. Uh, this is actually Google SRE principle number two. So I think one of the best examples of not ideal was the General Motors uh, Fremont Manufacturing Plant in Northern California. Uh, this actually has a very notorious reputation because it was for decades one of the worst performing automotive plants, not just in North America, but around the globe. Uh, and this was actually the site of the famous NUMI joint venture between General Motors and Toyota, uh, where it became one of the best performing plants. And so there are many documented uh, instances of there being no effective procedures in place to detect problems during the assembly process, nor were there procedures on what to do when problems were found. And so consequently, there were instances of engines being put in backwards, cars missing steering wheels or tires, uh, cars even have to be towed off the assembly line because they wouldn't start. And so that's, uh, that's not ideal, obviously. Um, what is ideal? It is this condition where we are creating as much feedback in our system from as many of the areas of the system as possible, sooner, faster, and cheaper, where we can get as much clarity between cause and effect. And we do this because we, are, we start to, avi uh, to invalidate wrong assumptions. And when we do that, we're learning, which improves our ability to fix problems and allows ourselves to innovate. And so one of the things that you'll see in uh, the learning organization literature is this phrase. Our goal is to learn so that we can outlearn the competition. And I think one of the most studied examples of a dynamic learning organization is Toyota. And the most famous example of a uh, tool that they use uh, is the Andon cord. And so um, I had the privilege in 2011 to go to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor uh, and spent a week learning about the Toyota production process. And it was amazing to me to find during the plant um, field uh, training that you know, on top of Every work center in plants modeled after the Toyota prediction system is this cord that everyone is trained to pull. Uh, so if I'm working and I create a defective part, uh, I pull the cord. If um, I get a defective part from someone else, I pull the cord. Uh, if I have nothing to work on, I pull the cord. And even if uh, my work takes longer than documented, if it was supposed to take 55 seconds and it took a minute 20, I pull the cord. And so everyone knows now, right, you know, what happens when you uh, pull the cord. It's that if it's not resolved in, you know, 55 seconds, the entire assembly line stops. So I did know that going into the training. What I didn't know was how frequently the Andon cord was pulled in a typical plant in a typical day. So in your heads, just think order of magnitude. How many daily Andon cord pulls are there in a typical plant? And the answer is this. 3,500 times a day. So um, when, during the training, I reacted like you. Um, in fact, my reaction was, uh, these people are idiots, right? They have no idea what they're doing. And I think that uh, reaction was framed by the way I was trained as a first line manager, which was, uh, I thought my job was to solve uh, problems in my area of control before it sort of ballooned into a global problem. And it seems like to me that the Andon cord does the exact opposite, right? We're actually magnifying errors so that local problems become global problems. And so when you ask people on the plant floor, why do they do this so often? Uh, there's two answers that they give that uh, I think are very startling. One is they'll say, if you don't put in a systemic fix then and there, problems will accrue downstream uh, where they become more expensive or maybe even impossible to fix. So that's interesting. Uh, sort of like technical debt. Uh, the second thing they'll say I, I think is even more poetic and profound. Uh, they said, if we don't put in a systemic fix then and there, we're going, to have that same, we're going to have the same problem 55 seconds later. And so that's the notion of a daily workaround. 
And so daily workarounds exist in our work as well, but because it takes longer than 55 seconds, uh, it's not as visible, uh, but it is just as destructive. And so that motivates this next point, which is that greatness is never free, right? We have to create greatness. And so much of this is, comes from us paying down technical debt. So someone wise once told me 15 years ago, uh, when dealing with executives, sticks with small numbers and primary colors, which I thought was very funny. Uh, but I've actually learned since then that when dealing with very senior people, that is not sufficient. You must stick with something simpler, which is up and down. So I'm going to tell you the story of how de technical debt is created by using only up and down arrows. So think of a situation where you were trying to get to market quickly, right? Either to be first to market or just get into the market, right? And so in order to get features in the market, right, we we're cutting corners, we're doing what it takes, right, to uh, create business value. That's where we start to accumulate technical debt, uh, which tends to drive down quality, and we start having more defects, right? So this doesn't look good, but you know, that's only the beginning. What happens as we go through time is that we find that our feature rate goes down, right? And, and, and the number of defects go up, perhaps even to the point where we were spending all our time, more than 100% of our time, just fixing defects. And so this is when our site reliability tanks, this is when we're going slower and slower, customers leave, morale plunges, and engineers just leave because everything is so freaking hard. And so John Cutler from the UX community, he tweeted this at me. He said, yes, that's exactly it. In 2015, a certain class of features would take 15 to 30 days. Three years later, same class of feature now takes 10 times longer. And so you're, if you feel like this has happened to you, you're not crazy. This is absolutely true. And it even happens when you're adding more developers. Uh, and it, you have this feeling that we're going slower and slower. And what is amazing to me is that every tech giant has gone through this, whether it's Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Microsoft. Um, so they made it, but not all of them have. One of the best books, the second book I'll recommend to you is uh, this book called Transforming Nokia by Risto Salasma. He joined the board of directors of Nokia in 2008. He was a founder of F-Secure. And it is this astonishing story, right? Um, and you would think, what, will you, what can you learn from someone who helped oversee the decimation of 95% of the market value of Nokia? Uh, and it is, I learned many things from it. But one of my favorite lines in this book was this. In 2010, uh, he heard from the VP of strategy at Nokia that the build times for the Symbian OS that they were relying upon to compete with the Apple iPhone, he learned that the build times was 48 hours. And he said when he learned that, it felt like being hit in the head with a sledgehammer. Because he knew that if it took two days for anyone to determine whether a change worked or would have to be redone is in two days, then everything that they were relying upon for near-term profitability and long-term viability was an illusion. So they, that was the reason why they quickly abandoned uh, Symbian OS and went to Windows Mobile, which turns out wasn't so good for them either, but it turns out that was a better bet, a far better bet than staying on Symbian OS. And so this is a story about technical debt. And every organization up here has gone through this, whether it's eBay, Microsoft after the summer of worms, Google in 2005, Amazon 2004 that led to the uh, famous refactoring of the Amazon Abidos application, Twitter, LinkedIn, Etsy, all these organizations almost died from technical debt. And all of them made a decision that uh, we have to curb features because it, become, it has become too dangerous to work on features. One of the most famous examples of this is the uh, famous 2002 Bill Gates memo called the Trustworthy Computing Memo. And he describes what led to a year-long feature freeze that uh, was all across all of Microsoft, whether it started in .NET, uh, then led to Windows Server, uh, then Exchange, SQL Server. Uh, almost every product group was affected by this. And in this memo, there's this line that says, if a developer ever has to choose between working on a feature or fixing a security defect, always choose fixing a security defect. He was saying that if we don't fix the security issues, this represents an existential risk to the future of the company. And so what all these organizations have done is they make a decision to bring features down to zero, right? And why would they do that? It's so that we can pay down technical debt, which allows us to increase quality, uh, which allows us to drive down defects, maybe not to zero, but something that is, you know, that we can actually manage on a day-to-day -day basis. And we then we re-platform, re-architect, and we actually end up 
being able to deliver far more features than we were ever able to do. Amazon famously announced that they were doing 136,000 deployments per day uh, in 2015. So it's not just uh, CEOs of these software companies saying this, uh, it's even UX and product experts. So this is uh, Marty Kagan. He wrote the most, one of the most revered books in the UX community called Inspired, How to Create Products That Customers Love. And he has trained generations of product owners to uh, make technical debt reduction as part of their daily work. Uh, he, the, the technique he uses is saying this, take 20% of all your engineering cycles and take them off the table. That's not there for you. That's there for the engineers to work on whatever they need to do to fix problematic areas of code or the environment or to automate or refactor or to replatform. And so why would he uh, believe this? It's because he was the VP of product management at eBay in the early 2000s, where he didn't ship a major feature for two years, right? Because uh, all engineering time was just trying to figure out how to keep the site up. And so his advice is, you know, you have to pay your 20% tax. And if you don't pay your 20% tax, you will inevitably pay 100% tax, where you're going to face what he did, which is that you're not gonna be able to ship features for maybe years. And so uh, the third ideal is how we enable greatness. In the ideal, uh, we're spending three to 5% of developer time improving, uh, three to 5% of developers dedicated to improving developer productivity. Uh, Google famously, uh, described how they have 1,500 developers working on dev productivity. So that's over a billion dollars of annual spend just on this problem. Microsoft has probably two to three X that working on this. Um, not ideal is the only people working on dev productivity and CI CD pipelines are summer interns and people not good enough to be feature developers. And what's interesting is that at the tech giants, Right, they're not putting summer interns on these things, they're putting their very best developers. Chances are that it's not only the most senior developer, but they're also people who have had uh, the most amount of operational experience as well. So in this kind of very strange, uh, amazing karmic continuity, um, Satya Nadella, the current CEO of Microsoft, uh, in a town hall earlier this year, he said, if a developer ever has to choose between working on a feature or working on dev productivity, always choose dev productivity, right? So essentially he's, they're playing the forever game, right? They're using compounding interest uh, to their advantage, right? As opposed to when we're accruing technical debt, compounding interest is working against us, right? So I think this is one of the best examples of how the best are always getting better. So the best are always getting better. Uh, here's another one, Google in 2013, they had 15,000 engineers working on 4,000 simultaneous projects, right? Locality and simplicity. Uh, they're doing 5,500 code commits per day. They're running 75 million test cases daily, right? That's amazing. But it is not as amazing as what they became. Google 2017, 30,000 developers, 45,000 commits per day. They run 150 million test cases daily, right? And so running tests, right, that's not free, right? It generates heat, it uses electricity. You know, you have to constantly be grooming the test scripts to make sure that uh, we're giving developers sufficiently fast feedback on their work, right? This represents an incredible engineering undertaking. Uh, I, not ideal. When we break our tests or break the build, no one cares. Ideal, whenever someone breaks their build or breaks a test, fixing it becomes the most important work of the moment, right? If that person needs help, right, we, if necessary, we drop what we're doing, right, so that we can help them and get things back into a releasable state. Not ideal, when someone needs a peer review, that person might have to wait days or weeks to get their plus one or plus two uh, in order to go into production. And <laughs> what's sad is they often have to merge every day. <laughs> so that, but when they uh, do the peer review, it actually works. So sad. Uh, ideal, you know, if someone uh, taps me on the shoulder and because they need a peer review, I drop whatever I'm doing because I know that the longer this person has to wait to go into production, uh, the worse the outcomes. And tomorrow might be the other way around, right? I might need a plus one or plus two to get in production, right? And hopefully they will do the same for me. Uh, just to share how innovative and surprising kind of these practices that are emerging are, uh, let me share with you that one that I found utterly unbelievable. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, they had a dev team where they wanted to do an experiment to put an and on cord uh, into Slack channel, right? So that when they're working on a feature, if anyone got stuck, they would type slash and on into Slack. 
and then the lights would go off, for siren, you know, sirens would go off, right, and they would swarm the problem, right? And my, my reaction was, that will never work, right? You know, and on cords are for, you know, highly repetitive work, right? For people who work with the hands, not for people who work with the heads. Um, but here were the results. What they found was whenever they increased the number of and on cord poles, the cycle time to get into production went down. And when the uh, number of and on cord poles went down, the cycle time went up. <laughs> so I wouldn't say this is a proven practice yet, uh, but it just shows you know, how many innovative and unintuitive and startling uh, discoveries you know, we have yet still to make. Um, and so uh, and on cord maybe even works for knowledge work as well. So first ideal was uh, locality and simplicity. Second ideal is focus, flow, and joy. Third ideal is improvement of daily work. The fourth ideal is psychological safety. And so this showed up um, in the state of DevOps report through the uh, Western organizational topology model. Um, and Ah, let's do this. Westrom organizational topology model. So in 2004, Dr. Ron Westrom uh, discovered the surprising link between patient outcomes in healthcare organizations and culture. And so uh, what we found was that the organizations that had the worst patient outcomes, uh, they had these characteristics. Measure, uh, messengers of bad news are shot. We discourage bridging between teams. Uh, we cover up failures uh, and new ideas are crushed. Uh, and so he called that pathological, kind of there was this other category called bureaucratic organizations, uh, or sometimes called merciful or just cultures. But then he found that the organizations with the best patient outcomes um, had these characteristics. We seek, uh, we actively seek information. We train messengers to tell bad news. Uh, we share responsibilities, right? We know that InfoSec is not just InfoSec's job, just like uh, the fact that availability is not just Ops's job, right? Those things are genuinely everybody's job. When failures happen, it causes a genuine sense of inquiry and we welcome new ideas. And so one of the, one of the biggest uh, kind of signals that we found in the early years of the State of DevOps report is that you know, culture, as measured by the Western instrument, uh, is one of the top predictors of performance. So uh, this, we've uh, validated this over, several times over the years. So uh, working on the Unicorn Project, it was very fun to um, uncover the work of Google, uh, the research at Google. So they had famously two projects, Project Aristotle and Project Oxygen, where their goal was to understand what made great teams great. And what they found was that it was psychological safety that was one of the most dominant elements. And so they called, uh, they measured it like this, to what degree can we feel safe taking risks on team without feeling insecure, embarrassed, uh, being blamed, or being ridiculed? And they found year over year that this was actually one of the top uh, markers of great teams. And so uh, in the 2019 State of DevOps report, you'll see some references uh, validating some specific notions of these findings. Uh, let me share with you uh, one other thing that we find in large complex organizations. So as uh, Dave mentioned, I've been running a conference called the DevOps Enterprise Summit uh, since 2014. The goal was to uh, have technology leaders share their experience reports. And since the early years, we had this sort of informal rule that this is a conference for the horses, right? No unicorns allowed. We want, uh, this is a conference for horses, by horses, large complex organizations that have been around for decades or centuries. And so over the years, we've assembled over 350 case studies of organizations, the largest brands across almost every industry vertical. Uh, but one of the things I've noticed uh, about these technology leaders is a certain thing, uh, they all seem very kind of, I would call courageous. So I got to follow um, uh, Heather Mickman around. She, for many years, was uh, the senior developer, senior uh, director of development at Target. They're the, uh, they're the US's second largest retailer. And uh, I followed her around for three days. And one of the, the most interesting things I saw was this thing that she had hanging on her desk. Uh, it's uh, the certificate that reads, Lifetime Achievement Award presented to Heather O'Sullivan McMinn for annihilating TEP and LARB. So that leads to the question, what is TEP and LARB? And she said, TEP is the form you fill out when you want to do something new, the technology evaluation process which allows you eventually to get into the LARB meeting and make your pitch, Lead Architecture Review Board. So you walk into this room and there's like two tables. On one table you have all the enterprise architects and dev architects. 
On the other table, you have all the ops and security architects. And uh, they pepper you with questions. They assign you 10 more questions, 20 more questions, and they say, come back next month, and we will reevaluate your proposal. And her reaction was, none of the engineers on my team should ever have to go through this. In fact, none of the two or 3,000 engineers at Target should ever have to go through this. Why do we even have this process? And she said, no one could really remember. There was some very vague memory of something unspeakably bad that happened probably 20 or 30 years ago. But what exactly that was you know, has been lost in the midst of time, and yet the process still remains. And I think that is uh, one of the most uh, remarkable characters of bureauc uh, bureaucracies and processes, is that they, uh, they are resilient. And so due to her endless lobbying, nine months later, they disbanded TEP and LARB, earning her this amazing certificate that hangs proudly on her desk. And, and so one of the things that we did in the State of DevOps report is actually test this hypothesis that we need kind of this kind of characteristic of leader. And we, we tested this in 2017. We asked 15 questions along five different axes. We asked, uh, to what degree does a leader have vision, right? Do they understand the grandest goals of the organization? Can they get in front of those uh, goals so that they can help with the achievement of it and, uh, and also be relevant? Uh, intellectual stimulation, to what degree uh, does a leader question basic assumptions of how we do work? Just because we've done something the same way for 20 years doesn't necessarily mean it's the way we should be doing work today. Inspirational communication. To what degree does a leader um, generate pride in being a part of the team? Can they generate a coalition around them to help overcome very powerful orthodoxies? Supportive leadership and personal recognition. And what we found was that leadership matters. Uh, the teams that had in the bottom 50% of reported transformational leadership characteristics where only one half is likely to be high performers. So you can do it, it's just a lot less likely and probably a lot, less a lot more difficult. So it is psychological safety and these characteristics that allow us to do things like blameless postmortems. It allows us to feel safe enough to do crazy things like Chaos Monkey, right? We're actually deliberately injecting faults into the production environment and we don't get fired. Instead, the reaction is thank you because we know that this is actually good for the long-term uh, survivability and reliance, uh, resilience of what we have in production. So this gets us to the last ideal of customer focus. So for me, this is actually one of the most genuine surprises uh, of my career. Uh, and, and for me, I learned it when I was at visiting the CEO of CompuWare, Chris O'Malley, with uh, a friend of mine, Mick Kirsten, the CEO of TaskUp. Um, and we went there because there, you know, we had learned so much from Chris O'Malley. Uh, we just wanted to spend a day with him and do a gamble walk of you know, how, how he leads. And uh, Mick and I were walking to uh, the CompuWare offices, and I was looking at the agenda they had prepared. And then the first agenda item was, data center tour. And when I read it, I was thinking, oh my gosh. I, I immediately apologized to Mick. I'm like, I, I'm so sorry. Right? I thought this was gonna be such a great day. I have no idea why we're getting a data center tour. I'm not sure what we're gonna learn by you know, uh, touring their halon extinguishers and their raised floors. But what I saw was actually really surprising. In fact, it uh, was probably one of the most surprising things I've ever seen. And it was this, because the data center was empty. So they had two Z mainframes. And then where the uh, racks used to be, there are outlines, like in a murder scene, of where the racks used to be. And in the middle of it are these tombstones of what used to be there, what business process and application used to be there, and how much money did they save by getting rid of it. And so by doing this, uh, they were able to reallocate $8 million of uh, cost from back office to front office. And so that went into R&D. And for me, this was actually one of the most startling, oh, and so there's also the sign that says uh, over 17 tons of equipment uh, removed and recycled, right? And each time they do this, they have a celebration uh, in the town halls. So why is this important? So Dr. Joffrey Moore talks about this in his uh, amazing book, Zone to Win. Uh, he also wrote uh, the Crossing the Chasm book, right? Zone to Win, in my mind, is even more important because he describes Core versus context. Core is what creates lasting, durable business advantage that customers are willing to pay us for. Context is everything else, right? So context, it can be mission critical, but that doesn't make it core. So payroll is important, right? It's important that we fulfill our obligations to pay our employees on time accurately and so forth. But customers probably don't care enough to pay us extra money, right? Just so that we can have world-class payroll services. 
right? And so what that slide, or that picture of the data center represents was an $8 million reallocation of context back into core, right? And so the reason why this is important is that what he talks about, what Joffrey Moore talks about in Zone to Win is that left unchecked, context will starve core, right? So not ideal is that we have functional silo managers and leaders who prioritize silo goals over the top business goals, right? Instead, we need to be able to ask about ourselves. Is this work what we're doing? Is that context or core? Is this something that customers genuinely love and will pay for? And if, they, if it isn't, then maybe this is work that we shouldn't be doing uh, in the long term. And just maybe one last nugget to leave with you. So I talked a lot about the measures that came out of the state of DevOps report. Uh, in the Unicorn Project, I talked about three metrics, right? That apparently is a key to business success for the last several centuries, right? And we should work in, in, in perpetuity, which is customer satisfaction, workplace engagement, uh, and cash flow, right? So customer satisfaction, do we understand what customers value? Do we have an in, engage and, uh, and uh, energized workforce who want to solve problems for our customers? And are we managing our business in a way that we don't run out of cash, right? So uh, I think DevOps definitely helps with the achievement of uh, at least two of those. So why do I think this is important? Here's the claim I will make, is that as much value as the tech giants have created, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Microsoft, Right? They've generated trillions of dollars of economic value, but that will be dwarfed by the amount of value that will be created when the largest brands across every industry vertical use the practices that were pioneered the tech giants and use it uh, in our daily work. Right? When we can elevate uh, the productivity of, of the 18 million developers uh, so that they're all as productive as if we were working at a Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, or Microsoft, there's no doubt that will generate tens of trillions of dollars of economic value per year. And when we do that, suddenly, you know, even the most difficult problems suddenly become uh, plausible to fix. And so the five ideals, uh, where, where I'm, my goal is to really try to help frame some of these important issues by contrasting what greatness looks like and what not so great looks like. And uh, one of the things that I'm just so delighted by is that uh, the book came out last week and uh, we learned that it hit number two on the business uh, hardcover bestseller list. And I think this is so great because now the Unicorn Project, a book about technology, is now showing up alongside books that business leaders buy. So I think uh, this is important for our, our movement and uh, something that I'm just enormously pleased by. So uh, if you want a copy of this presentation, if you want uh, free excerpts of the Unicorn Project, both audio and uh, written and a whole bunch of other stuff, if you want uh, links to the free videos of all the DevOps Enterprise Summit talks, just send out an email to realgenekim at sendyourslides.com, subject line DevOps, and you'll get an automated response uh, with all of those things, and I'll tweet it out as well. Thank you so much, and with that, uh, thank you, Dave.